Happy Monday! Welcome to the Monday Morning Data Chat. Every Monday morning, Joe Reese and Matt Housley have candid and unscripted chats about all things data, sometimes with special guests. If you want unfiltered and honest conversations about data engineering, data architecture, data science, and analytics, this is the show for you. It's time to chat, so let's get going. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. <laughs> good morning, Joe. Good morning. Cool. I hope everyone had a good weekend. So, and uh, we got a special guest today, uh, Leo Gavesh from Monte Carlo. Um, uh, looking forward to this. Uh, we, we kind of accidentally also came up with a uh, made up uh, month holiday called uh, Observability October. So you get to uh, help kick things off. Um, but yeah, for people who don't know who you are, do you uh, want to give a, an intro about who you are and what you're up to? Sure. Um, hi, Joe. I'm super excited to be here, and, and I love the, the the observability October uh, fest. Uh, so, by way of introduction, my name is Lior. I'm originally from uh, Israel. Uh, came to the Bay Area about ten years ago uh, for school. I went to Stanford uh, along with some of my current colleagues. Um, I then after school, I started a company in the cybersecurity space. Uh, its name was Sukasa. Uh, we were building kind of analytics and, and ML based solutions uh, for cloud security. Uh, we had a good run uh, and eventually got acquired by a company called Barracuda, uh, which was then a kind of a public uh, security company. Uh, at Barracuda, we ended up uh, building a lot of machine learning based products for, for fraud detection for very special cases of, uh, of phishing and fraud. Um, I ended up leading the, the engineering team there uh, for a while. Uh, and then about two and a half years ago, uh, my co-founder Barr, uh, my co-founder at Monte Carlo, uh, reached out uh, and uh, told me about this wonderful problem that she's working on uh, and convinced me to join Monte Carlo, and and uh, and that's what I've been doing uh, in the last couple of years, and it's been a great ride. And I, I bet we'll talk about it today. Um, but that's me, in short. That's awesome. That's quite the ride too. So, congrats on uh, the uh, the first company and the success with that. So, and you guys have uh, Monte Carlo has blown up um, quite a bit. You guys came into my radar, I think, right as you were um, um, kind of launching. So. It was been cool to watch. Kind of backing up a bit. I mean, we hear the term data observability being thrown out um, all the time now. Observability in general is just sort of the, um, you know, the hotness. I mean, what what is data observability? It's a great question, uh, and and one it's it's one that we we worked on quite a bit in the early days of Monte Carlo to even define what it means or or what to do about it. And and the way we define it is. Uh, as follows. Um, so what we've been seeing is that um, a lot of companies out there are making investments in data, right? Um, they want to leverage their data to uh, to grow faster, to save costs, to build new products uh, and new markets. And um, as they do that, they essentially start treating data as a product, right? Whether it's used internally, uh, for analytics, for decision making by various stakeholders in the company, or uh, it could be building machine learning models. Um, they're making automated decisions for the company, uh, or it could be uh, data stores that are used, that are actually a product that are part of a digital experience or sold to partners or otherwise used. Um, and as those things are happening, it became increasingly important uh, to productize these things, right? To make them ready for uh, for people to consume uh, with little handholding from the data engineer or the data scientist that, that built the first thing, the, the thing in the first place. Um, and uh, and when you productize things, and that's something we've seen in other uh, domains as well, right? One of them is software engineering. When you want to move from you know, a pet project you've been coding up in your free time 
uh, to a service or a product that other people are people are using, um, you start thinking about uh, things that 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 were important before. And one of the biggest things that you, you'd be thinking about is is reliability, right, and trust. How do you make sure that the thing that you're delivering to your customers uh, is reliable and works for them when they need it? And how do you really manage the SLAs around it? Like nothing is 100% reliable, uh, but how do you make sure that it's reliable enough to be trusted and to be useful to the people that are consuming it? Um, and um, over the years uh, in, in software engineering, in security, in other domains as well, um, emerged this idea of observability, right? The idea that at any time that that you're not building black boxes, but rather you're creating a visibility into how the system works, and through that visibility, um, you're able to understand how healthy the system is and manage that proactively, right? And not only that, you're able to do it as a team, right? Uh, a very important concept is in observability is. Um, you don't have to call the person that built it every time it breaks, but rather as a team, you're able to, uh, to know that issues are happening, uh, to resolve them, to address them, uh, and even to prevent them from happening in the first place. So that, that's, that's kind of observability in general. Now, double-clicking into data observability, uh, we view data observability as, um, as the ability to really measure the reliability and health of data products, right? And data products in a lot of ways are similar to software products, uh, but they're also very unique and different. Uh, different stack, different types of challenges, different types of reliability issues that can happen. And so we've kind of coined the term data observability uh, to capture that, right? The set of methodologies, the set of tools uh, that teams need in order to uh, deliver reliable and trustworthy data products. What, what What is a data product? That's another term I hear thrown about a lot right now. So the way I define a product, uh, a data product is, um, I, I'm happy to share examples, but um, yeah. the, the way I define it is uh, a, a, a data set or something that gets used by people other than the person building it, right? It's something that gets self, often, uh, oftentimes self, self-served um, mm. by others. Uh, what it is, there's there's a lot of different examples. Uh, one of them, one kind of category is, is, is analytics and dashboards, right? I'm sure a lot of the listeners are building uh, Looker and Tableau uh, dashboards that, you know, a PM uh, might use to understand how how a product is working, how the marketing team might use to, to understand how campaigns are working, how that, or that sales might use to understand how what pipeline looks like for the next quarter. Um, different stakeholders in the company might be using those dashboards. So uh, this is a product, right? Like these people go into Looker and look at those and use those dashboards uh, and live off of them without ever talking to the person that built them. So it is a product. Um, another kind of product is that that we see is is a machine learning model, right? So you put a machine learning model to, to predict something. Like personally, I've spent a lot of time building machine learning models that try to predict uh, whether a certain piece of text is is fraudulent or not, right? Mm -hmm. uh, other people are building machine learning models to um, to predict, um, you know, the 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 ETA or your next cab ride uh, or many other things. And, um, and machine learning models likewise are trained on data, are created from data, um, but then they operate independently, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The person that built them doesn't control them anymore. Uh, and so it is a product that's used by, that it impacts the digital experience that the company delivers. Um, and then a third category that I see is um, it's just analytic data stores, right? So if mm -hmm. you uh, go into your um, I don't know to your Amazon uh, account and look at all of the at, at how many dollars you spent there uh, in the last uh, three years, and you're uh, like a little bit concerned. Uh, that's really data. That's anal analytics get, that gets served to you as a customer, 
And that's increasingly a bigger part of, of the digital experiences that, that we consume. Uh, sometimes it is the product, right? Uh, for many companies, uh, those dashboards are the product that they're providing to their customers. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, we, we see data products all the time around us, increasingly more. Um, and, and that's why reliability has become so important. And that's why, and, and because of that, that's why observability uh, has become increasingly important in the last couple of years. I'm a bit curious. So what, what was the motivation originally uh, for Bar and for you to found this company? Like, what, what were you thinking about when you, what triggered this idea of a data observability product? I could tell you my own stories at some point. And I'm sure Joe has stories. Everyone who's been in the data space has stories of data quality issues and the entropy of data. But I'm curious what your experience was and what Bar's experience was. Oh, yeah, uh, totally. So it's kind of funny. Um, so Bar, uh, I'll start with Bar. She was, um, before Monte Carlo, she used to run uh, operations at a company called Gainsight. Um, and Gainsight, conceptually, you could think about it as a data platform for customer success, right? For, uh, for teams that uh, help companies adopt digital products and, 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 and increase their usage, obviously. And, uh, upsells and retention and all that good stuff. Um, and at Gainsight, Bar essentially uh, one of one of the things she did was to help um, companies implement Gain Gainsight. Right, uh, get to the point where they manage their customers and they can uh, proactively uh, manage their success using data uh, and not just uh, uh, gut feelings. Uh, and that process was very, uh, very insightful for her because uh, she saw how companies from small startups to Fortune 500s uh, spend a lot of time and money uh, investing in data uh, to solve real business problems and struggle. All right. Uh, it's incredibly hard uh, to take that data. And, and make use of it. And one of the biggest challenges she's seen was that I was that issue of, of kind of quality and reliability overall. Mm. Um, and she ended up building kind of, um, you know, makeshift solutions for, for Gainsight customers and it actually helped. So she, she was actually successful with, 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 uh, with, with bringing reliability into data there, but obviously it was kind of a, tailor-made solution for Gainsight customers. Go uh, yeah. Uh, it, 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 surprisingly, it was, is, uh, uh, a lot of it was a, a bunch of a, a very powerful Excel sheets. So that, that was the kind of original Monte Carlo, if you will. Um, so when she left Gainsight and started thinking about what she's going to do next, she was kind of, um, th this kind of stuck with her as something that's, that's just a challenge across the board for so many companies. And, um, she went out there, she, she interviewed, I think over a hundred data teams, uh, uh, the, 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 the motivation was to make sure it's not only gain sight that was struggling, but kind of see whether, <laughs> whether that's happening across the industry. And, and, and the answer was overwhelmingly yes. Like everyone's struggling with that. It's a mm -hmm. problem. It's something that keeps people up at night. Uh, seriously, like they're. So sometimes their careers are on the line. Mm. Uh, and so it really resonated or it, the idea of solving this problem really resonated. Um, and, and, and that was a very, very powerful exercise. Uh, for me, I came from a little bit of a different angle. As I mentioned, uh, I was actually working on taking kind of machine learning models to production and, and, and we built products that, that are used by tens of millions of people today. Um, and when I was looking back at the reliability of that product, I realized something kind of hit me on the head there, which is um, we had, if you look at our downtime, if you will, um, it was overwhelmingly uh, because of, data, of, of what we now call data downtime or data quality issues, right? Um, and it was, it, was, it, it, it kind of really, I was really curious, like, why, are, why, like, why do we have so few other problems, so many 
data problems. And mm -hmm. the, my conclusion was um, we had very, very good um, kind of folklore knowledge, industry knowledge about how to control a software application, how to manage the reliability, right? Uh, it's called DevOps or site reliability engineering or, or whatever name you call it, but it's a set of disciplines and methodologies and tools that help you make sure that your infrastructure is up and running, that your application is up and running, that you're shipping code in a consistent, predictable way. Um, and that's why we were so good at it, right? Like that's why we we're able to minimize our application or infrastructure downtime to pretty much insignificant. Um, whereas with data, we were flying blind, right? Mm. Uh, we were building pipelines, we were training models on top of them. And there was very little um, understanding of how to make this whole thing reliable. Um, and so that, that was kind of, uh, an interesting thing for me. Oh, like people are going to build more things with data. People are going to build more machine learning. How do we help them do that in a way that, that they can be proud of, of, of what they built. Right. Um, so we kind of came together around this idea, um, and, and, and decided to start Monte Carlo around it. We felt there was a huge opportunity to build something that would be very meaningful and impactful for, for the industry that, that, that we've been working in. So we're excited awesome. about that. That's a good story. Uh, Ku, uh, what's up Ku? He's a friend out of Singapore, um, big leader in the AI community out there. He says, uh, can you give me an example to show the difference between data observability and data quality? Yeah, of course. Um, so um, data quality, um, I, I imagine you're asking yourself, like, what's new, right? Data quality has been around for probably a couple of decades, Thousand maybe years, even more. Least, yeah. uh, so, uh, so what's new here? I think data quality is one of the foundations of data observability, right? Like, um, if you think about data quality, at least historically, it's mostly been an exercise of um, let's take the data, usually upon ingestion, um, and uh, run certain business rules on it, right? Let's make sure it doesn't have nulls. Um, let's make sure that, um, that the data is formatted a certain way. Um, let's make sure that all, um, I don't know, genders are, uh, are, are a certain set of prescribed, uh, genders, right? Um, so that, that's kind of, or that's at least how I perceived it equality. Um, and it's very important, right? It's a very important foundation uh, where data observability kind of takes it one step further. Um, so several ways. One is um, is the idea of end-to-end -end observability, right? So I think data quality originally was kind of done upon ingestion. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and in a lot of systems, that's it's probably enough. Uh, but... Uh, what we're seeing in the last few years is just systems getting a lot more complex. So suddenly you're not just ingesting data and putting it and aggregating it into a report. Suddenly you have dozens and dozens of data sources being transformed uh, in, a, in a potentially, you know, several dozen deep uh, layers, deep uh, DAG, uh, and then being used by dozens and dozens, sometimes thousands of data products downstream, right? So the whole mm -hmm. complexity thing uh, got a lot a lot more complex in the last few years. Um, and, um, and, and, and suddenly it's not enough to, to do data quality at, at the source, right? You, you need to look at the data as it is transformed in every step of the way from the source and all the way down to the product, right? To the to the analytics dashboard, to the model, to the data store that that's being served. Um, so that's that's one aspect of data observability, the kind of end to end. The other aspect is that it kind of brings together um, data quality with operations and metadata, right? So like imagine um, imagine you have a kind of data quality program and you've set a data quality rule that uh, makes sure your uh, you know, emails are not null. 
and they're formatted a certain way, great. Uh, now it fires off, right? Like now you're suddenly getting a, a, a batch of data that um, it doesn't comply with your data quality rules. What do you do, right? Um, traditionally, um, you would have a lot of these. And I think from what I'm hearing, most people just end up ignoring those because it, it was impossible to act on. The idea with observability is to make it actionable, right? Help you understand, okay, if I have this issue, what is it impacting? Like who needs to know about it? Uh, who owns that? Um, what's driving it upstream? Like what is feeding into that? What, what are some potential causes of this issue? What are some operational aspects that, that might be impacting? Um, is it correlated with a certain infrastructure issue or application issue that's happened, right? And so it's a much more holistic view that kind of brings together data quality, operations, and metadata to help teams. Um, it's, it, or, 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 you know, in, in data observability, you kind of stop thinking about individual tables or, or, mm. or, or even fields and start thinking about how a team can deliver quality or reliability on a, on a set of tables, right? And some of our customers have hundreds of thousands of tables and thousands and thousands of, of, of downstream products. Um, and it's a whole other challenge. Like where does data lineage fit into data observability? We think it's critical. Uh, so uh, when we started Monte Carlo, it was pretty um, obvious to us that if you do not understand lineage, you cannot do reliability properly, right? Because you, you, you can't even tell what you need to monitor, right? Like let's say you want to, you have this dashboard that your entire team is using, your entire company is using or your executives are using and you wanna make it reliable, right? If you don't understand lineage, you don't even know what you need to monitor. You don't know what's feeding into it. Uh, you would have to uh, either manually uh, do a lot of work to find out or find someone who knows and their knowledge is probably outdated because it's been changed 10 times since. Um, and so you wouldn't even know what to monitor, right? Without lineage. Similarly, if you have an issue, um, is it important? Like, is it going to impact anything? What is it going to impact? Um, who needs to know about it, right? A lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the 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 issue with trust, right, uh, is actually letting people know. I think people using data yeah. will uh, accept it. It sometimes break. What 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 diminishes trust? What erodes trust is when they find out on their own, right, rather than someone proactively telling them like. Hey, there's a problem here and I'm working on it, right? I'm going to fix it and then update them that it was fixed. Um, so building that trust is a lot about transparency, right? How are you going to do that if you don't understand uh, what the data issue that you're looking at uh, impacts downstream, right? And there's a lot of advantages in terms of um, resolving problems quicker, right? And um, if you understand what's feeding into a certain data set, uh, you can get to resolution much quicker and you can narrow down the space of, of problems that can happen. Um, so yeah, we, we believe lineage is, 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 is absolutely critical. Uh, it can even prevent uh, reliability issues from happening. Talk to teams all the time. They're wanting to deprecate a certain field or a certain table. Um, historically, it's been incredibly hard to do without lineage. Um, and so you end up with a lot of debt, right? You, you just never remove anything and end up with a lot of tech debt or data debt. Um, and that's, that's a bad state. But then if you start removing things, uh, you're risking breaking downstream stuff, right? Like if you mm -hmm. don't know what's, what's consuming the data. Um, and so lineage, and, and that's just one example of how lineage can actually prevent uh, downtime from happening in the first place. Uh, and so we, when we first built Monte Carlo, we were, um, we were, uh, it was really obvious to us that, that we needed to do it. And, uh, and we thought, oh, great, like Lineage, um, I'm sure a lot of other companies are building it and we're just going to integrate and it's going to be fun. Uh, and we were wrong. Um, apparently it was, it was uh, a problem that pretty much nobody uh, was able to solve. And so we ended up solving it internally. So today, Monte Carlo uh, can fully and automatically 
um, essentially reverse engineer uh, lineage from an environment with zero input from the data team and kind of map all the dependencies uh, all the way from the data lake to the data warehouse to the to the BI tools uh, and any other uh, kind of downstream products and um, and and our customers find it incredibly valuable uh, in tackling some of the reliability challenges. That's that's really cool. I mean, presumably that means that if you if you detect a data quality issue somewhere in the pipeline, have you automated the process of tracing back and finding the source of that data quality issue, whether it's happening upstream or in some transform somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. The, that, that's that's the holy grail. Um, I, I wouldn't tell you that um, you know th there's no silver bullets here, right? It's not we're not going to you know th there's still the some element that that engineers need to do, which is great, but we can certainly help uh, with that process. And um, the the way we've been able to do that is if you take lineage um, and you add to it um, an analysis, an automated analysis of how the data shifted, um, and then visibility into how the code shifted, like what changes happen in the transformation code or what ad hoc queries were ran there, what backfills ran there. Um, and if you add to that an operational view, um, have you had any issues with airflow, for example, with one of your databases? Uh, so if you take that, you know, all that information and put it in one control center, that helps you uh, quickly understand all of the key events that happen, you can actually drastically accelerate um, resolution uh, of data quality issues. Um, and that's something that, that, that's, that's been incredibly powerful for, uh, for our customers. Um, got a question from uh, Ask DevOps here. Um, what's up? Uh, Ask DevOps always has good questions. Um, uh, it says it's a hard pitch um, to sell this to companies, which has a changing data and budding data, data engineering team um, where real owners um, uh, can't yet be uh, defined. Um, do you have any recent success stories um, around getting around this hard pitch? Oh, uh, yes. I mean, uh, we've had uh, actually dozens and dozens of success stories. So there's, we're, we're lucky to have um, over a over hundred uh, teams using Monte Carlo in production uh, to manage their reliability, uh, including Fortune 500 teams. Um, I think um, it, it's it's definitely true, right? The the ownership is not always uh, clear. There's a lot of kind of organizational challenges with these things. Um, I think where we've seen uh, the most success, if you will, uh, is when there's commitment in the in the organization, right? Uh, when you see uh, both the data engineers uh, and leadership kind of getting behind this and deciding like, hey, we're going to build something that we're proud of. We're going to build something that the organization and our external customers are going to trust. Uh, we're going to be proactive about it and we're going to spend resources to do it, right? I'll be the first to say Monte Carlo or, or really any observability solution is not like a plug and play, let it run in the background and it will solve all your problems kind of thing, right? Right. Uh, you really need to adopt like an operational mindset, right? Um, you need to set it up. You need to make sure that when issues happen, they're followed up on and they're acted upon in a timely manner, that they're communicated. Um, you know, you need to adopt the the equivalent of DevOps, right? In, in Is a that sense, data right? ops? Uh, you could call it that, yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you need to adopt uh, data ops um, and uh, and be committed to it, right? And in or and 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 we've seen it, right? Uh, increasingly, organizations are recognizing that this is something they need to invest in. That it doesn't help if you have a lot of data and a lot of products, but nobody trusts them, uh, or right. you're running around and doing fire drills fifty percent of your time, and you have uh, you don't have the attention to to build and improve things, uh, right? You're, you're just ch chasing fire drills. Um, and so they've decided to, to commit to it and to kind of do a little bit of a 
a mini transformation there. Um, and they've been incredibly successful. So I think uh, just like DevOps, if, if you if you adopt the methodology, if you adopt the tooling, uh, if you start, you know, uh, acting on it, it's it's very manageable and, and you can see outstanding results. Yeah, I think Matt and I see this though, especially in uh, you know, with DevOps, right? Companies will try and do DevOps, but without the culture and the organizational willpower in place, it just sort of falls flat. And I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and plus, it's you know, and actually, we have a kind of related question here. Uh, good question asked DevOps. Um, Alexander Stage asks: um, Most of the data observability tools are targeted at a technical audience. Um, do you have any idea how to turn um, data observability tools into something that business users? and business decision makers would care deeply about and use on a daily basis? Great question. Uh, one, that, one that we also kind of thought through, uh, you know, along our, along our journey with Monte Carlo. Um, so I think, let, let me split my answer into two. Uh, I think in terms of caring deeply about it, I've, um, I've already seen uh, many business leaders that are that care deeply about this topic, and the reason is very simple: they experience it viscerally, right? They uh, they experience the problem of data of, of broken dashboards all the time, and it's uh, it's frustrating to them, and it's something that seriously uh, undermines their ability to use uh, data, right? That that um, understanding that. Uh, I mean, once you see a dashboard broken, you'll always ask yourself, like next time you go and, and look at it. Is it broken or is it not broken today? Should I trust it? Right. Uh, and so people get it uh, from, from what I've seen, at least. Um, it's a little bit of a different um, um, question about using a data observability tool. And, and my personal stance on it, um, at, at least my two cents, is that um, they shouldn't use it. Right. In the same way that. Um, you know, uh, we use, uh, I don't know, we log into Gmail and we use it, right? And we expect it to work. Uh, we don't use the the observability tooling that, that Google engineers use behind the scenes to make Gmail mm -hmm. reliable, right? Uh, we just expect reliability. And I think it's similar here. Um, we want data engineers to use it. We want data analysts to use it, uh, sometimes data scientists. Um, but really, business users should not just have great, highly reliable uh, data products. Uh, so they do understand the problem deeply. Um, but it, I, I think the accountability at the end of the day is on the people that are building the tool, the, the data products in the first place. I agree. And I think it's also a matter of um, it's our responsibility to sell it correctly, too. I think all too often. It's the old saying, you know, uh, people don't buy um, eighth inch drill bits, they buy eighth inch holes, right? So it's it's the same thing with selling technical tools to business users. Uh, business users really don't care, as you point out with Gmail, whether what observability tool they're using in the background. They just want to make sure Gmail is up and running and um, exactly. you know, and works, right? So I think data is the same way in a lot of cases. You talk about data products, and this is very much sort of the quality control mechanism you'd have in a factory that produces products. It, to me, it's... Um, it all comes back to ops and ops comes back to just basically it's rooted in manufacturing principles from like decades ago. And so it's, um, if you can keep yeah. those things in mind, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I would say, you know, maybe one way, Alex, also just to, uh, you know, con convince business users and, and decision makers of this is, well, um, so what happens if you're flying blind, you know, with, uh, and you know, literally have no idea how you're running your business. How are you going to do that? So... Yeah, to me, the best approach would be to point out some really concrete examples of how your data has gone bad within the company. Mm -hmm. Because every organization I've been inside, like as a consultant or as an employee, has had these problems where Everyone. sometimes data disappears. Like you'll have a data source and suddenly half the data disappears for like six months and no one notices. So you have these reports that are basically <laughs> bad for six months. Or very commonly, I mean, especially where organizations are, required, are relying increasingly on data that comes from the outside. Data gets mm -hmm. injected somehow. So, for example, a common, you know, any any company, most companies these days care a lot about search. If you're Spotify, Amazon, Google, obviously. And with one client, we had a situation where 
all these searches had gotten injected in their data. And what happened is there was a test tool that was automatically running searches and that wasn't yep. getting filtered out. And so you can go to the business and say, hey, this is the kind of stuff that's happening. This sat here for six months. It was messing up our search machine learning models in terms of how searches were returned. Like these are the kinds of things we need to catch before they happen. And this is a tool that can help us to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, someone once described Monte Carlo as like a, a smoke detector for your data, right? Yes. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, you, you see it all around in 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 pretty much any uh, human made product, right? Like you need to put those guardrails in place and and the detectors because because reliability issues happen if you know if you have a sufficient number of humans building something together that's uh, that's sufficiently complex, like you're just going to have those problems. And um, and it all ties back to the value of, of data to the business, right? I mean, those companies are, are investing so much money in data because they believe it can drive business. And it, it, it's obviously in different ways if you're a fintech company or an e-commerce or a marketplace or uh, or a B2B SaaS business, like the ways by which data will make an impact are different, uh, but it has a huge amount of impact on business outcomes and observability is kind of this um, layer that makes sure that you maximize your your returns on it and that you're actually able to, uh, to deliver that value, right? To productize that value sort of flip a question on its head. I mean, when when would data observability um, not be a, a great approach for a company? A oh, great question. Um, I think um, it's um, it's kind of different cases where it doesn't make sense. And, and um, one of those cases, for example, is um, if you're not building data products, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I've uh, I've seen companies where, you know, there's a data team, they, uh, you know, every report is custom made, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there's a question, so someone goes and like, picks up the answers and writes the report. And that someone spends the extra time validating the data really and kind of sanity checking and make sure making sure that it that is that it is reliable. And that kind of works, right? If you're if you're doing it ad hoc, um, kind of custom made, handmade, then uh, like observability is not particularly important. Um, another case, um, if data is just not a, a huge area of focus, uh, maybe you have a very 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 small team, very very small operation. Um, I think um, you know in in a the, the the pain might not be huge uh if you have a very small footprint uh where you're just building a handful of of reports from a handful of tables um it's likely that it is all already reliable or that it's easy enough to make it reliable without kind of adopting a fully you know a full operational and and kind of mindset and and, and all the tooling that comes with it um so yeah i i don't think it's it's for everyone Interesting. Got another question here from uh, Kimberly Wright. She asks, um, how does a service like yours affect data sources, uh, data source liabilities and insurance concerns? Um, I'm not quite sure what she means by insurance concerns, but maybe maybe you can pick up on that and ad lib or something. <laughs> so. Yeah, Kim Kimberly, if you have, uh, if you want to add more color, I, 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 I'm happy to make sure I, I'm answering your question. Um, but um, If you're referring to um, uh, to the idea of kind of security and privacy, uh, and and how the data that you're consuming, how how the data that you have in your system that you're consuming from sources uh, interacts with an observability solution, then um, that's definitely something we we hear a lot, and 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 obviously a lot all of our customers care about this. Uh, as they should, they're they're the guardians of guardians of their their own customers' data. Um, so um, I, I think it's a critical question for every single 
data infrastructure solution out there, right? It's, it's observability is not not special. Um, we've taken um, a little bit of a unique approach there, which is um, we've built, um, you know, on one extreme, we could build kind of an on-prem solution that would allow our customers to keep all of their data inside their own environment, uh, fully in their control. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we could have built a, a you know software as a service solution where we host everything uh, and we pull everything into our environment. Uh, obviously, the 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 former would feel more uh, secure uh, and would kind of limit the blast radius and and potentially liabilities uh, related to the data. Uh, the latter is is much easier to deploy, uh, is much higher quality because we can operate it and upgrade it all the time. Uh, we decided to take a hybrid solution that really allows our customers to install uh, some elements of our system into their infrastructure. Uh, that makes sure that their uh, exposure, their external exposure is minimized. Uh, you know, they don't have to pass on any data into our environment. Um, you know, that all of their records, all their PII stays with them. Um, and then we're still able to deliver that kind of software as a service experience where um, uh, where you get upgrades multiple times a day and, and it's fully managed by us and, uh, and all works really nice. So the, the hybrid approach has really helped us kind of mitigate the security and compliance aspects of it, uh, including liabilities, uh, regarding, uh, third party sources, uh, and, and, and also deliver a great customer experience and, uh, and a great product. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Mohammed uh, Shorfa has a uh, question from uh, YouTube. Um, how do you keep track on data quality on version data? Um, what type of governance um, should be put in place? Is it a process strategy or a platform strategy? What do you think? Uh, great question. Um, so um, as far as as, as uh, versioned data goes, um, we really hope our uh, customers um kind of manage that in the in the way that makes sense for them so generally speaking um there's um you know monte carlo can automatically out of the box uh do a lot of kind of sanity checking on the on the data including version data so for example it will automatically make sure uh, that you're getting new versions at the cadence that you're expecting to get new versions. That's an example. Um, when it comes to validating the data uh, and kind of tracking it across the versions, um, we really give a set of tools to help customers customize that to uh, to to whatever they need, right? So you can think about it um, in a sense. Version data is is partitioned data, right? Um, and so we've, we give people, uh, powerful tools to, uh, to control how we measure quality across partitions, um, or within a partition. Um, so, so it can really be customized to different use cases. Um, the, um, and, and I assume you ask whether it's a process strategy or a platform strategy, and, and, and I imagine that ties to. Uh, to data observability as a whole in general, not just version data. And, and, um, and to me, it's, um, it's a combination of both a little bit. Uh, so there's a platform strategy element to it, which is adopting the tooling, right? Monte Carlo and other tools, by the way, I don't think Monte Carlo is the, Monte Carlo is the only thing you need to, uh, to deliver reliable data. Um, so, uh, you want to adopt certain tooling into your platform strategy, but then, as I mentioned, also critical to adapt your process, right. And adopt the kind of operational discipline around it. Uh, so it's really both, uh, it's, it's kind of this unique, uh, neck of the woods. Got it. Um, quick question. Somebody asked, are, are you guys, are you all fed around? Uh, we are uh, SOC 2, but not FedRAMP at the moment. Cool. Yes. 
Um, Alex, actually, he refined his question a bit. Um, basically, uh, can you envision features uh, from Monte Carlo that are used by business users? Um, any any business facing things? All right. Um, it's a great question. I think there's some elements of it that can be exposed to business users. Um, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, so for example, um, when, um, when I have a problem with AWS, when something is not working, uh, what do I do? We go to status.amazon.com yep. and try to see what happens. Right. Um, and, and you could call me a business user in this case, right? I'm, I'm a cons consumer of the, of the product. Uh, so I think there's definitely uh, room for uh, for an observability solution to also expose things to to to, to business end users, right? Uh, so it could be something like a, a status page that helps people self serve to data quality instead of uh, finding uh, the BI team on Slack and pinging them, "Hey, my dashboard is not working." Right? Uh, so so there there's that interaction. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely think there's, there, that there's, uh, room to, to interact with business users. So last week, uh, Matt and I did a, a show on, um, the, uh, 20, 21 data landscape, uh, Matt Turk's infamous, um, slide with, uh, I think we jokingly said there's, there's more startups on that slide than there are like atoms in the known universe. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the data space is exploding right now, right? There's Monte Carlo and there's like uh, one trillion uh, other data companies on, on the scene. Where do you see the space going over the next three to five years? Oh, uh, great question. I, um, um, you know, I I, I I wish I knew. Predicting the future is really hard, but uh, strangely enough, yeah. And. <laughs> Um, and, 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 um, you know, if, if I had to kind of share my two cents, like, um, I, I, I couldn't, um, tell you which startups are, are going to, to be very successful and which won't, but, um, but I think that the, the industry is definitely from what I'm seeing going, uh, into more and more, uh, productization of data. Right, like we're mm. seeing it with our customers, you know, loud and clear. Like people are just building a lot of things that are driven by data and are making them self-serve available to um, uh, to users across their company and outside of their company. And with that uh, come like a variety of challenges. Right, like you need to be able to uh, build these things in the first place. So I think there's a lot of kind of interesting companies to uh, to transform data, to ingest data, to store data, and to make that whole process, uh, more, you know, easier, more managed, more, more reliable. And I think we'll, we'll see that kind of, uh, picking up. Um, I think, uh, there's companies, uh, obviously I'm a huge believer in data observability, like it's going to be important to make those products reliable. Um, and. I think there's going to be interesting companies that help with with the problem largely described as as data discovery, right? Like, mm. okay, you build these uh, these hundreds of products, thousands of products. How do you help people find the product that they should use, right? How do you make that accessible to to business users or or others uh, and help them find it and understand how to use it? Um, and so there's uh, and, and those just are a few of the challenges that come with, with data productization. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of innovation around that and, and, and a lot of interesting companies uh, tackling those challenges. And, and some of them are super innovative and, and I'm sure it will be very su successful. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, we've talked to uh, Raghu Murthy a bit about the, the nature of the, these new tools that have come out. And his point was that like a lot of these ideas go way, way back um, there. They, they showed up in enterprise products decades ago, but the, but it was a very monolithic take back then. 
And uh, it, Joe likes to talk about how we're moving back toward the enterprise um, approach to data, that is observability and more control of data and master data management and such, except that in the current era, the evolution is that it's like a bunch of different tools that are accessible in theory to any company, as opposed to having to pay for Informatica and Teradata and like a huge right. It's kind of like if you took the uh, yeah. if you took the data management book of knowledge, the DM book, and basically um, just take a chapter out of that. That's basically a whole slew of new startups yep. that you can do that were typically just done kind of in the uh, in the old days and kind of blue shirt and khaki enterprise companies. So um, and it's we moved an exciting from like, time. when we moved from like buying a car. You go down to the dealership, you buy your Ferrari or your Tesla or whatever to buying Lego bricks and you're buying these kits and then you have to assemble <laughs> Lego bricks into something coherent. Yeah. Yeah. It can get really confusing, I think, for yeah. for customers to understand what what to even put together. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see some consolidation around that as well. Um, and yeah, I agree. A lot of those ideas tie back to things that or. Um, are things that have been known for for a long time and 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 adopted in in some enterprises. Um, it's just um, you know a new take in the sense that it's a it's a new stack. It's a cloud stack yeah. that ever, anyone can can adopt. Um, it's kind of designed for more for more scale, for more velocity, um, for more self serve. All right, uh, more more distributed. Um, there, there's this concept of uh, data mesh that mm. uh, that I think a lot of people I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people are, are excited about that, which is the idea of like um, doing this governance and and management and and observability and discovery, but doing it you know doing it centrally, but in a way that enables a lot of people in the organization to, mm -hmm. to contribute and build on top of that. Um, so it's all uh, kind of new takes, and 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 hopefully it will allow more and more companies to to do it well. Let's hope so. I mean, it, it seemed like for the longest time, you know, a lot of these things like observability and data management were, um, I wouldn't say ignored, but it was just sort of. Uh, I don't even think people were aware that you could do this stuff with data, right? Um, and what's been really cool is just seeing the, the number of companies, you know, including Monte Carlo, coming out and just I think. Um, really democratizing these, these practices for, um, you know, both big and small companies. Again, it, it was sort of monopolized by just very monolithic, very expensive products um, mm -hmm. that unless you're at a certain scale, there's just no way in hell you're going to be able to afford those, no matter what you think about whether it's a good thing or not. So it's, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, for a lot of our customers, the, the option they had before Monte Carlo was to essentially, uh, you know, build on their own, like adopting uh, the, the kind of enterprise heavyweight solutions was just not not a right. plausible option in 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 many ways. Yeah, and I mean these enterprise solutions don't support modern interop. In other words, they're not mm -hmm. going to help you to simultaneously monitor your cloud data warehouse, maybe your on-prem system, your data lake, like. I feel like even fairly established enterprises that are a bit old school have many, many data tools now that they need to be able to monitor in a coherent way. Well, yeah, because I mean, the cloud introduced something that you didn't have yeah. on-prem either, which is the cloud's basically a giant 3D printer for um, data products, right? So um, how do you do quality control in a situation where you can just spin up and spin down resources at a moment's notice, right? And of course, some of these systems will hopefully be uh, around. It would be weird to have a data stack that... Um, kept uh, like you know, imploding on itself every five minutes. That would sort of be the purpose. But the point is you can you can spin up and down tools at a moment's notice. Um, and that's that changes a lot of things. So yeah. yeah. Gotta, it became too easy to build these things, right? Like way too easy. Uh, too easy, right? Uh, so yeah, now now the the governance around it needs to catch up, right? Like mm -hmm. we don't want to go back to you know centralized uh, authority where you can't build anything, right? Uh, you want to enable that velocity and enable that, you know, kind of self-serve uh, autonomous building, uh, but bring back some of the visibility and, and so, some of the controls, uh, that existed in order to, um, in order to kind of balance the, you know, velocity with, with reliability discovery, et cetera. Yeah. Right. That's a good point. Uh, kind of wrapping up here, I mean, um, if people want to find out more about you and 
Monte Carlo, what are some ways I can do that? Um, so um, please, uh, you know, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn if you um, if 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 you'd like. Uh, we're also um, we're we're actually super excited. We're having the, our first uh, conference this November. Uh, we have a, a fantastic lineup with Bob Mulia, the CEO, the ex CEO of, of Snowflake, with the creator of, of Apache Airflow, with uh, with the creator of Data Mesh, with uh, a co-founder of DataBricks. So we have a lot of awesome speakers. So please join us and 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 we're going to hear a lot of interesting things about how to how the data industry came, came to be what it is now um uh and yeah also visit our website montecarlodata.com uh we're there and we'd love to hear from you awesome that's awesome yeah, that, that uh was it the impact summit is that what it's called yes or? impact yeah yeah you guys have a, a stacked lineup especially for your first conference um yeah was, we're super really excited cool yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, speaking of announcements, Matt and I have um, something to share with everybody. The uh, first two chapters of our book, The Fundamentals of Data Engineering, cool. is uh, now out on early release on O'Reilly. So this just got announced uh, late Friday afternoon. So go check it out if you have an O'Reilly account. Um, you can also spin up a two-week trial. So in the first two chapters, we cover what is data engineering. Um, uh, we cover uh, the data engineering life cycle as well as the undercurrents of data engineering. I think you'll find this book is a lot different than other data engineering books where we don't, when we, when we start out writing this, we're like, okay, so what's not going to change over the next few years, right? There's going to be a life cycle to data. There's going to be undercurrents to this life cycle. Um, and so we focus on the, the bigger picture of data engineering. So it's not, uh, you know, a, um, another copy of Spark, the definitive guide or some like thing like that, where it's tool focused. We really focus on the bigger picture concepts that we feel data engineers are going to need, not just today, but, um, you know, they're going to need in a, in a world where um, tooling is becoming increasingly abstracted and simplified. So um, this is a definitely a more forward looking um, data engineering book than we've seen out there. So if you have an O'Reilly account, check it out. Um, it is early release, so I, I already noticed there's a few uh, typos in there, but plenty, uh, yes, plenty, yeah, plenty. run and cut. So, and the uh, first two chapters are likely going to change quite a bit between now and uh, when it's published in Lord September 2022. But anyway, um, check it out. I think you're going to like it, um, and obviously, feel free to give us feedback as you uh, uh, see fit. So, um, and as always, um, you know, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube, uh, Ternary Data. Uh, smash the like button on this video. Lior's a cool dude, so it's good to have him on the show, um, as well as subscribe to our newsletter at ternarydata.com. Um, and again, uh, it's been a pleasure having you. Like I said, a big fan of what you guys are doing over at uh, Juan Carlo. It's, it's awesome to see your success. And um, yeah, hope to have you back on uh, sometime soon. So good thank luck. Thank you guys. That was a lot of fun. And congratulations for the book. I'll, uh, Thanks. I'll go check it out. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Well, we'll see everybody uh, next Monday. Again, we kind of made up a, a fake holiday month called uh, Observability October. <laughs> so we're going to continue uh, talking to um, uh, people doing ML observability and um, you know other types of observability. So this is, this is a lot of fun. Um, I think it's a topic that needs uh, a lot of attention right now. There's a lot of um, I think there's there's a lot of uh, confusion when I talk to data engineers about what observability is. So hopefully we can. Um, help uh, provide some clarity in that with guests like we are. And so thanks for coming on, man. It's good to see you. Thank you guys. Take care. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye. Take care.